Actions speak louder than words. I That is absolutely 100% true in my book. Yeah. You can always tell what the people, what they value by where they spend their time and their money. Like people talk, people just talk, 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 yeah. talk. You can pretend to care, but you can't pretend to show up. Bang. This for anybody that's trying to follow a dream. No holding back, you'll get it by any means. Idols on the wall, you cut out for magazines. Full of self esteem, nobody can intervene. Ready for the shine, you never need in the shade. This is for the boss that never gave you a raise. This is for every time you ever tried to create. And no one understood, they never gave you the space. Walking up to you, they trying to give you the crown. Look into your eyes and tell you you want to bust. Every time you turn around to face the crowd, be ready because your time is now. It's my time, I thought they Hello and welcome to The Golden Rules. I'm your host, Tim Gray, and today we are coming to you from the beautiful Starstruck Studios right here in Nashville, Tennessee on Historic Music Row. And this evening, we are super lucky. We've got Miss Pam Matthews in the studio. Thank you, ma'am, for joining yeah, us. You're welcome. I really appreciate it. Thank you. This thing is so new. Um, I've just been blown away with everyone's responsiveness and willingness to come on and do this. Uh, it sincerely means a lot to me that you're taking the time. Um, very flattered that you asked. Yeah, thank you. Oh, well, for those of you that don't know Pam, you're in for a hell of a treat today. 30-plus uh, year industry veteran who's had experience in practically every facet of the business from uh, promotion, talent buying, marketing, artist management. Hell, she's been a runner. She's been a tour accountant. Venue manager. Venue manager, yeah. absolutely. Uh, got her start at uh, Mid-South. And that's my neck of the woods. I grew up in Corinth, right outside of Memphis. Oh, my so. dad's mom's from Corinth. Oh, no shit. You can there tell you by go. the way I said it that I know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's right. Not Corinth. No, it's Corinth. Corinth. That's Corinth. right. <laughs> uh, and then transitioned over to Pace, working with promotion legend Louie. Louie. Uh, Louie. And then, uh, I didn't know this, but I thought it was awesome when I was Googling you yesterday about Starwood. Yeah. She helped build... 18,000 capacity venue just south of Nashville here from freaking scratch. From dirt, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was a goat farm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really, I know. It was I goat came farm. up, I had family that lived in Antioch. Oh, yeah. It was where nothing, and then it was there. Antioch, where they rock. <laughs> and then uh, transition into management, where she eventually worked her way up to vice president and treasurer working for the Judds, mm -hmm. uh, before eventually becoming GM of the Mother Church, Ramen Auditorium here in Nashville, historic, incredible venue. Uh, if you've never been, you must go. Yes. Uh, once she was there, not only did she buy and book incredible talent from multi, uh, multi genres and put together bands that probably would have never been on stage together for special events and stuff, but she was able to get it uh, registered as a historic landmark and also got it as first pole star. Uh, uh, what is that, an Auditorium of the Year Award? I think it's, that one's just Theater of the Year. But Theater yeah. of the Year Award. Mm -hmm. um, from then, she's transitioned to uh, IEBA with the uh, International Entertainment Buyers Association as the executive director, where she oversees this year, or 17 at least, a uh, membership of 1,400 with over 850 buyers and promoters, 300 plus agents from all over the country, actually all over the world, yeah. um, and then a bunch of randos like me that show up and hang out. Uh, she's been listed as billboards, uh, 20 Most Powerful Women, Nashville Business Journal's uh, uh, Women in Music City, and, and on and on and on. Every music industry publication you can imagine. Uh, diverse background, true road warrior, lover of live music, operational queen. And I just can't wait to dig in today. I think you guys are going to get so much out of it. So thank you again for being here. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, of all of that that I dug through and... I mean, I probably spent three hours just reading about you last night from all these different publications. of stuff that I just didn't know that didn't come up when we were chatting wow. last. Okay. And uh, I was really incredibly fascinated, but nothing told me the, the before story. <laughs> like, where was home? How did you oh, grow Memphis. up? What's the origin? Oh, you Memphis. were in Memphis. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I've had people in the state of Tennessee since 1797. But wow. my dad's grandmother is from North Mississippi. Really? But that kind of counts. Oh, yeah. Corinth we and Memphis are stone's throw. Hopping a skip. So my dad was in the grocery business. It's a lovely and honorable business. Sure. But it's not that exciting. Yeah. So uh, growing up, my, one of my best friends in high school was Jeff Dunn. And his dad was a pretty famous bass player, Duck Dunn. Shut up. Yeah. 
So um, I used to answer the phone and make sure that the mail uh, was in. And uh, if you don't know, that's Booker T and the MGs. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and so then, really, by the 70s and 80s, Duck was on the road with Clapton, uh, Phil Collins. Uh, oh, I don't even remember. Petty? Huh? Petty? No, Petty had the Heartbreakers. Oh, I thought he was on the road with him. Possibly. I'm, I'm guessing. I have it's no idea. It's yeah. possible, but I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so um, I was super responsible, and Miss um, Dunn went on the road with Duck a fair amount, and they just lived down the road, and I was good friends with Jeff, and so I would um, take the messages off the Codafone, write them down, <laughs> bring the mail in, sort it, make sure the pool was clean. Yeah. And uh, so I literally took phone messages from... Eric Clampton and Phil Collins. That's awesome. Talked to Phil Collins on the phone one time. He called from his honeymoon on an island somewhere. And apparently I was very businesslike. I was 15 years old. I was very businesslike and did a good job. And so Ms. Dunn said, what are you going to do for a job this summer? And I said, I'm not really sure. There's always a job at the grocery stores. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, well, if you want to do something fun, um, I'll get you an interview. And this is a great story. It's one of my best stories. So I go down to Mid-South Coliseum on a Tuesday at 8 o'clock in the morning. And promoters at that time were regional promoters. They had a section of the country, and they did all the shows in that section. And Bob Kelly's office was at Mid-South Coliseum. And it was a little shoebox, really probably a, smaller than this. So a little reception area where Betty sat, and then Bob's office was behind that. And Betty had a desk, and there was about this much space and one chair in front of her. So I went in, and I said, um, I have an appointment to see Mr. Kelly. And she said, take a seat. And so I sat, and I sat, and Bob got up and left, went to have lunch, came back. And I sat there until 5 o'clock when Betty left. Wow. And I said, should I come back tomorrow? And she said, it's up to you. So the next day, I was back at 8 a.m. I brought a book a lunch, an apple for me and an apple for her, and I sat there till 5 o'clock the next day. I did it one more day, and at 4.30, Bob said, be back here at 8 o'clock in the morning uh, with a full tank of gas. Wow. And I worked for Bob for five years. Well, I went to high school and went to college, and yeah. That was uh, Mid-South Coliseum was one of my first concerts that I can remember going to, Debbie Gibson. What? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm sure I went to other ones young, younger. I just don't remember. But it was the first time that I was ever blown away with live, and that was Garth. Oh, yeah. It was the first Thunder Rolls days, out of the so, floor elevator. So, Garth opened for the Judds. That's a great legacy of the Judds. Is they were a big damn deal. Oh, um, yeah. Which is, you know, something you, you think about more as you move further into your career. Is like, it's super fun to be... Luke Bryant right now. Sure. Let's see what that legacy is in 20 years. Absolutely. Um, and I, I am a little sad that I don't think the Judd's legacy has been preserved to the extent that they deserve, in my opinion. Sure. But Garth opened for the Judd's. Alan Jackson opened for the Judd's. I mean, Some of the greatest, every, yeah. everybody opened for the Judd's. Yeah. You know who that reminds me of is Kiss. Everybody opened for Kiss. Kiss gave so many bands their start as the opening act. Tons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, those guys, I had a chance to speak and kind of work with them loosely through Six Man. And I tell you what, Gene Simmons, oh, Gene he's and incredibly Paul. smart. Oh, they both Just are. Just incredibly smart. Oh, they both are. By the I time, didn't have a chance with Paul. but By the time I worked for them, they lost their first fortune. Mm. And they were not going to do that again. Sure. Through bad management. He, uh, he came to town, and there was a thing. Uh, this was literally right when I moved to town. Uh, five, seven years, something like that. Uh, and Saad was at their 15th year, and I just kind of snuck into one of their member-only events. But Gene was speaking, and he said something that stuck with me ever since, and it said, if you want to run with the big dogs, don't piss like a puppy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why it stuck with me at the time, but it always has. I'm like, okay. Well, here's my two Gene Simmons. One, living real is the best revenge. Like, just get revenge off your to-do list. Sure. Just you live your life, and everybody will be... They'll do what they do. Yeah. And then he used to also say, um, when people would, like, a, be a bad review or a mediocre review or somebody would say, we've done this T-shirt before, he would say, hey, man, there's some kid turning 15 every day. That's the truth. Absolutely. But it's, I mean, he's, yeah. 
I, I really, and he's also like a jokester. I spent more time business-wise with Paul on the road that I did with Gene. Sure. I settled every show with Paul after the show. Now, everything I read, it kept vaguely saying heavy metal tour account, but it never said who else. How long were you on the road? What all, like how long were you out I did, there? Did you work um, with? I did Kisses, uh, Lick It Up. I did Animal Eyes, and I did Bark at the Moon, and then I did some of Priest's Turbo Tour, Judas Priest. Was this a natural, were you a rock head growing up, or was just that's just the door that opened and you started that's going to that? That's just the door that opened. Okay. Um, and when you promote a concert, it is absolutely not necessary to give a crap about that act. You just have to know who does and where to find them. Sure. And motivate them. Absolutely. Because you can't love, love every show you do. Yeah. It's just not possible. If you do 200 events a year, you just can't. Of course. But I did, I did have Kiss Alive 2 on an 8-track. So it's not like I didn't know that stuff. Sure, yeah. Yeah. So Memphis, 15, you start... You're doing your thing, you're out on the road. When did you actually transition to, to Nashville? I went to Asheville, Nashville in 85. Was, okay, no, uh, it definitely wasn't then. It was 90s before Starwood, right? No, Starwood opened in 86. Was it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, man, you guys got right on it. Oh, yeah. Building that thing. It didn't take a year to build it. By the yeah, time I guess I... so. It's, it's a shed, so there's not really a lot of structure on the front, back end. It's just grass out there. Yeah. I'm sure there's ample work, but I mean, well, it's not like Well, and stuff, a... it's not like it was... Fabulous! The day we opened it, we sure. with as more capital came in, we built more stuff. Oh, uh, that venue was incredible. The reputation it had for never knowing who was going to come out was. Well, that's Nashville, though. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, incredible yeah. shows I saw yeah. there. So you were at uh, Starwood, and then the Judds, and then uh, tell me a little bit about how the ramen came into play. Oh, <laughs> um. So I um, had not spent a day unemployed since I was 15. I went from one job to another, to another, to another. Oh, no, you know what? That's not actually true. I, that's not true. In between, in between a couple of tours, I taught ballroom dancing. Actually, I snuck that question in here because I read that somewhere. Did I say about, that in another interview yeah, somewhere? Yeah, this was like a, a long time ago. And it was said, it didn't say much. It just said, ask about dance instructor. Yeah, and I, I was did. Like, I was like, I'm afraid to ask her. For like nine weeks, because <laughs> I didn't have a gig. I, and yeah. that mercenary stuff is not for me. Sure. Like I, my friend Lisa has done that since the, literally 1990, and she still does it. It's just I don't, I'm not built that way. Sure. I don't have that, and I don't have the entrepreneurial spirit. I do not play with my own money. Sure. Like I just don't. It's not my, it's not my deal. Yeah. Um, anyway, so um, Rod Essig, um, when, the Judds had everything in-house. Mm-hmm. Just like Dale Morris did with Alabama. Yeah. So in-house booking agency, in-house promoter, in-house merch, uh, own their own trucks and buses, uh, the whole deal. Sweet um, deal. Yeah. Um, so then when, then when Winona went solo, um, the girls ended up suing all that management team, as often happens. I mean, sure. that's just the nature of it sometimes. Um, and we went outside, and Rod Essig was Winona's agent for, I don't know, four or five years. I mean, Rod Essig is a chick singer's best friend. I mean, just if you look at that roster, it's chick singers. Sure. And he knows how to treat them right and really, you know, tour them right. Yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, I, it was the first day, um, first Monday of my unemployment. I'd quit the Judds after 12 years. I had done... They hired me. They could afford to hire somebody like me on Greatest Hits Volume 2. And we did Farewell Tour. We did all of Winona's career. Um, the Judds promoted their own concert on New Year's Eve 1999. Um, and I don't know how much you remember about that night from a concert standpoint, but everybody was going to play somewhere. And then more than half just chickened out. All that Y2K stuff. And, oh, yeah. um, but we did it, and we sole promoted it ourselves, um, made cleared several million dollars in one night, Come netted, it, cleared it, cash flowed it. Um, and, then I, and then Brian O'Connell bought the mm -hmm. Judd's reunion tour, the first tour he bought. He just moved here from North Carolina, working for Wilson Howard, just moved here. Um, so I got that reunion tour rolling. 
And it was, you know, like July, and I was like, look, I've been here for 12 years. That I'm, you know, I've done yeah. everything I can. I need to just take a break for a minute. So it was my first Monday of unemployment. Uh, Rod Essie calls the house and says, I've got your new gig. They're looking for a real general manager at the Ryman Auditorium. I'm like, dude, a guy's coming to see about putting a pool into my house in the backyard. I'm going to be having margaritas at 4 in the <laughs> afternoon. You're going to have to call me back. And then he just did. And I met with Steve Buchanan, and that was July. And I already had this, like, month-long tour of Italy booked. And so when I got back from Italy, I started. Well, that's freaking awesome. Yeah. So Rod S. got me that gig. Chick's <laughs> best friend. <clears throat> there you go. Yeah. The, um, so with someone starting uh, as young as you did yeah. in the industry, yeah. Uh, you learned so much over that time. If there was anything that you could go back now and say, man, I wish someone would have told me. Uh, is there anything that you wish if someone would have approached you and been like, these three things you must know before you start your career? Dude, I have no idea. Yeah. I, I think, don't think I would have listened. I think listened. people, you don't, way you too just didn't listen. No, I don't, they probably did tell me. I'm just a guy oh, that I, I need to touch the stove out and know it's hot. Oh, I don't. No. Buddy, I don't. I can honestly say I never did a line of cocaine. Yeah. I pulled one bong hit in my life. Oh, like so that was. I had like, to test all the sins. I had I to go do not. all that stuff. I did too. not. It took me a while to balance it out, but I had to know. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm not that way. Yeah. Um, I had great, you know, many, many, many times I was the only girl on the road. Sure. I was the only girl working, and my bosses took care of me, and yeah. the bands took care of me, and. Well, I'm sure. Good girls don't do cocaine. Well, going you know? into uh, going into live and being on the road, just road warrior, uh, warrior, Mississippi. Yeah, it just pops right <laughs> We're out just sometimes. Warrior. We're gonna wash. <laughs> We're gonna wash it up later. Exactly right. <laughs> but to do that much and then be in charge of all the money, that had to be an incredibly interesting and challenging experience at times. Oh yeah, so and probably beneficial a lot of times too. Tons of cash. Tons yeah. and tons and tons of cash. Before computers, before laptops, before any time tellers, yeah. tons and tons of cash. Lots of cash. Um, so I would have tons of cash that I would face and strap a lot of it myself. Sure. So on days off, we had uh, vaults built in the front bay of, or front lounge of the bus that had cash in it. Um, I have faced and strapped so much money. And after a while, it just becomes... A widget. It is not money anymore, and that's the best way. Sure. And I, you know, I grew up in the grocery business, so we had tons and tons of cash too. Yeah. I mean, I was facing the strap in cash early by nine or ten years old. Yeah. Like it's just, and then all the coupons, the hard paper coupons you would get, you would have to sort those and send those into the manufacturers to get your checks. So it's just, it didn't. Cash sure. money didn't mean anything to me. Sure. The, um, and I was never scared of money and never scared of math. Like, yeah. that's, I, I think that's really good advice. Well, I was thinking more along just, you know, settlement. Dealing with dudes on the road and the challenges that come with all of that. But of being I the had only been on the promoter the side for so long. And oh, so you already knew all the tricks. Nobody's oh, dude, pulling any I wool. stood at a copier, a Xerox machine, and made three copies of everything. And while that's copying, I would look, I looked at everything. Sure. I was in the room settling with Bob when I was 16 years old. That's awesome. Yeah. Which uh, is why the band handled me, because, hired me, because they knew I knew all the tricks on the other side. Of course. And then when I went to work the artist, I knew all the tricks for those sides. And so you just cross-pollinate. Yeah. I knew everybody's tricks. I've never done radio, and I've never done record company. So those guys could pull it over on me. Yeah. I doubt Maybe. it. Maybe. I doubt Maybe. it. Um, one of the... Things when I was looking out, uh, you know, at the sea of executives in town, I was thinking of who, first off, would actually show up if I invite them to the show. But <laughs> who do I really want to sit down and get to know better? And I was thinking of people that have been pivotal in my life, whether they've realized it or not, and yeah. people that I really looked up to that, you know, they may not even know I existed, but I gave them a pedestal when I moved here. I was like, I'm chasing you. You yeah. don't know me yet, but I'm chasing you. Yeah. Was there people like that along your career that were pivotal or mentors that you had that really showed you kind of this is the path? Tons. Um, Miss Dunn. I'm Duck Dunn's wife. Always looked like a lady. Always behaved like a lady. Um, Duck was great. Um, Eric Clapton was, was great. Um, and that was just early on. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think you also learn, you learn, I want to do this and I want to not do that. So, you know, 
A lot of people in the 80s fell victim to drug addiction. It was never attractive to me, you know, grinding your teeth sure. and, you know, all <laughs> yeah. that kind of stuff that, like, it's like there was not anything attractive about that to me. Yeah. Um, and then here in Nashville, um, you know who people don't talk about that much is Scott Borchetta's dad, Mike Borchetta, hmm. owned a building. So right across the street and behind it. So if UA Tower is 50 Music Square West, he owned a building behind it. He towed me one day, towed my car one day. Mm -hmm. um, he managed the Beach Boys and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, he was great. That. That's awesome. Um, and then in Nashville, you had Donna Hilly and Francis Preston and Connie Bradley. Um, one time, Donna Hilly, um, who ran Tree, um, made lunch for me in her office, which she did for people, and she sort of told me, we would call it, she jerked a knot in me. Sure. She told me that this is how it needed to be. Not, not this thing that I appeared to be exploring, but this is how it was gonna be. Mm -hmm. And she was right. You need those from time to time. Oh yeah, like there's a couple of times that I've called another woman and said, we need to go have a talk with her. Yeah. Cause this is not how we act. This is not what we do. Sure. We don't do that. When did you think, how long were you into your career? When did it get for you where you were like, I can do this? Like it was just clear, you feel like that it you had clicked for you? Almost immediately. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew Memphis really well, so your first job as a runner is to go get this list of stuff. Sure. And that first day I felt comfortable with it. That's awesome. Yeah. It didn't... I, I had to try on lots of hats to figure out what my thing was going to oh, be. Oh, I've never known what I wanted to do. When the door opened and it looked like a nice view from that side, I just walked through it. I'm going to go do that right I'm going to go do that for now. Yeah. I've mm. never had a plan. I don't know that that's possible. It, you know what's been uh, really fascinating is everybody that's set here, only, only the publishers are the only people that have like, nope, this is it. Everybody else I've talked to has been like, oh, I was a photographer, and I was this, and then I was that, and then I was on the road, and I was in a band. It's like only the people that were song first are still song now that I've interviewed so far, which is really... See, I don't have any ears. Like, yeah. nobody ever let me pick the single. Because I, yeah. I liked this. I didn't like that. Sure. I don't have that. But if, I'm really good with money. If you give me some money, I will make more money from it. I can make money. I'm going to give you my money then. I'll probably make some right. money. All right. <laughs> I'm just really good at making money. What's, uh, what's your favorite part of the business? Is it, is it the music? Is it the hustle? Is it the relationships? Like, What's your favorite part of the day-to-day? -day? Um, I, like, I, like the, the sh I like show day. Mm -hmm. That's just the greatest day ever. Just that excitement of leading up before oh, showtime. Yeah, just when they crack the trucks and the equipment starts to roll out and the, the crew setting everything up. And, yeah. um, and I especially like it in an arena. Because, you know, everybody's watched those time lapses. Oh, I know. That's, those I are those. the That's best awesome. ever. And then the crowd comes shuffling in and everybody's eating catering. And then there's the lights go down, there's the roar. And, Everything is possible, and something different happens every night. I love that. And then you break it back down. I love loadout. Yeah. I love loadout. I love to watch a stage manager call loadout to tell the local crew how this truck's going to, and that truck, 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 and that truck's going to be loaded. Yeah. I think a truck pack is fascinating. I've never actually seen one. I don't it's, think. it's like there's no, there's no air in there. It packs. Just perfect. Perfect. Tetris. Yeah, it's Tetris. Yeah. yeah. It's cool. I love a truck that pack. Is. Um, ha having to do as much as you've done, uh, I mean, different facets of the industry. Uh, and I I've seen it in action, even just this year with Aiba, like how rapidly you're making decisions. Uh, what's your process behind your decision making? Is there like a core principle that's guiding you? Like, or over time, have you just. Over know? time, I just know. Yeah. Yeah, you just, I just trust my gut. I don't think too much about it. Yeah. Um, so I'm teaching a course at Belmont. Now? I'm trying to fix the space because it's not my favorite thing so far. And when I say teach a course, I mean two nights a week for 16 weeks. And there is no textbook, no curriculum. It's a brand You're new doing this course now. right now. That's awesome. Mondays and Wednesdays. What is this? It's on fairs and festivals. It doesn't have a fancy name. It's sure. just, so it's outdoor, multi-act, live events. Um, because the curriculum at most of the universities that have college or have programs in music business have focused on 
publishing and songwriting, and songwriter rights and recording rights, and here's how to do a record contract, sure. which is all still valuable. What about live? Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, that's awesome. The, the top ten earning acts last year in North America, each of them made, well, with the exception of Drake and Kanye West, everybody made more than 80% of their net revenue from touring. Yep. 80%, over 80%. Sure. So it's where the money is right now. Uh, yeah, clearly. 80% isn't even close. Yeah. Um, but back to your question. So in teaching outdoor, live outdoor to students, um, I have realized like how much I just gut. Like I have to just back up and go, oh, okay, here's the basics. Mm -hmm. Like just stuff that you just sure. know. And, I, and another thing too for me personally is I have been in Nashville for 33 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I didn't have to change playgrounds. Sure. It's my playground. So I, I, it's my park. Yeah. Like I know the ins and outs of the field. I know the deal. Absolutely. And so that's made it easier too. How, how, would, how did this, um, you know, class, how did this Belmont thing come, come about? Did you feel like called to do it? You wanted to go share the knowledge oh, no, or it was just no, no, random? No, no, um, So IEBA has a very um, focused educational outreach mission. Um, we, uh, IEBA has donated more scholarship funds to Belmont than anyone wow. or anybody except for Vince Gill. So we've endowed a lot of money. And then I go teach there a class, like guests teach. Sure. Yeah. Um, but, the, but the primary reason is um, Dr. Sarita Stewart uh, has been a professor there for over a decade. And she and I have been best friends for a long time. We've known each other for 21 years. Mm -hmm. She worked for Cub Records for 15, 16, 17 years. So I knew her when she worked in the, at the label. And I was with Winona. And she asked me to teach it. Sure. So I'm just not going to say no to Sarita. When did it start the semester? You're already in it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It started in January when they came back, and it runs through April the 28th. That's awesome. I go speak as often as I can, too, um, and I try to paint that exact same picture that you were talking about. Whatever your thing is, there's a home for you. Math, you're cooking, you like doing people's hair or makeup. Yeah. Like, you can be passionate about whatever and find a home in music without being an A&R executive or a manager. Oh, gosh, yeah. You know, and I always try to point people to live because that's where I started. Right. I was like, you will learn more about the damn business in yourself on the live side than coming in and interning, you know, whatever. Well, artist managers have to be, I mean, they're the most well-rounded because they have to know something about everything. Literally, yeah. And Every that's facet. that's the most well-rounded yeah. in the it. business, I think. I'm going to come, I'm gonna come sit in your class. Okay. What, uh, for someone who's leading an organization that's growing at the rate that IEBA is, that has all these type A personalities and big personalities and incredibly smart people and risk takers, all shapes and sizes of the, fa of the business. Uh, what are the core skills it takes for someone to do that job, like your day to day? Um, well, I think that, so uh, I, uh, I operate at the direction and discretion of the board. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that we ask ourselves all the time is, is, is whatever we're doing, does it serve the membership, and does it serve the industry as a whole, and does it serve the next generation? And if it doesn't fit that criteria, we probably shouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I think one of the... the I felt this way about the Ryman. So the Ryman, when I got a hold of the Ryman, it did about 18 concerts a year. It was a beautiful heritage brand that everybody had a warm and fuzzy about, but the building had only been reopened for technically really maybe like four years. Um, and I, so I 
because I'd spent so much time in Nashville and so much time in Tennessee, I understood the brand and I loved the brand. And plus, I love Nashville as a market, so it was easy for me to breathe life into that. Sure. And Aiba has been around for almost 50 years, and it sort of languished. Everything has its season, and things wax and wane, and it'll languish mm -hmm. for a little bit. So it's my first Aiba conference was in 1989. I have a warm and fuzzy about it. Everybody does. It had just languished for a minute, and so it was nice for me to come in and rebuild that heritage brand. Sure. Um, did I answer your question? Oh, the core, the core values, the core principles. No, it was just um, what your day is like. Like, oh, it, it does somebody varies. need to be incredibly smart, incredibly organized to come in and run an organization I would say that size? Both, and I would say also a little intuitively. Sure. Um, so at Aiba, um, and at the Ryman, like I'm not the star of the show. I'm not the center of attention. I'm mm -hmm. not. Yeah. The, the Ryman is the center of the tension, and the organization and its membership is the center of the tension. It is not, it's not about me. Sure. What was that like to come in and take over a building that has such a rich history, and it was so uh, highly regarded, you know, of, it was the mother church. Like. Yeah, but I, you know, in, in the late 90s, it didn't have that cachet. It had really sure. faded. Just, uh... Because, you know, the building set empty, full of pigeons for 20 years. I didn't know how long, but I know it had gone yeah, through so that. Yeah, so the, um, the Opry went to the Opry House in 74, and in 1994 it reopened. Okay. So for 20 years it was empty. Wow, I didn't, I didn't realize it was that long. I knew it sat there for a while. 20 years. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, so moving to Nashville, I mean, when I moved to Nashville in 85, Lower Broad was someplace that you did not go unless you... Sure. And it wasn't even like strip clubs. It was like peep shows. It was, you just mm -hmm. didn't go downtown. There was no shows at the Ryman. Yeah. You went to Exit Inn. You went to Cantrell's and other places. Were there just no down. other bigger rooms other than two, three hundred cap stuff like Exit Inn or like, as far as like being a uh, music city, um, you know? It ain't, it was not that's like this yeah, now. This is yeah. different. <laughs> Nashville right now is different. Nashville after 1991 was different. That's, I mean, this is a huge growth spurt. 91 was pretty big, too. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, there have been waves where there's 19 cranes, turn around and count the cranes. Like, this sure. is not the first time this has happened. Of course. Um, I mean, since I've been here in 85, and you talk about the unicorns, the natives, they'll go, oh, please. Um, 328 Performance Hall had live music. Um, the Cannery and Mercy Lounge, that whole, um, in fact, um, so Starwood was Pace, and Louis put Steve Moore here. And so we were open from May through October, and then we promoted shows off campus at Municipal Auditorium and at clubs. We did yeah. shows at the cannery. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, was your, what was the culture like? What was the team like when you came in uh, to take over the ramen? Was it a total rebuild basically as well? Do you have a core squad there that can um, help you get things where you wanted it to the go? The production team was there, um, and there were some shared services with the Opry House. Um, so the Opry and Ryman are like brother and sister. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're much closer than cousins. Like, they're very closely intertwined, sure. and those businesses run that way. Um, and there was an event manager, Brian Gavron, was there. Brett Himes was there as the marketing manager, and then he went to uh, TPAC. And I think that was it. How, I, like, I got to, a list of people that I needed to fire when well, I got there. What's sometimes you when you come in? No, but I, the two, they then. gave me, like, oh, they said, like here are the two people this. I need you to let go, <laughs> and then here are the people that you might want to let go, and yeah. then figure out what else you. Yeah. Uh, well, if you came in, you had, you had to breathe new life into it, and I'm assuming that's looking, like really digging into talent, digging into, all right, what's going to help me do that? Oh, did we? Oh, you mean from a personnel standpoint? No, I meant from just a talent standpoint. We used we to call him, in. Allie Harnell and I used to call him beg people to play the Ryman. Yeah. Beg, beg, beg. Did it, did it affect it when you were trying to rebirth that because all the pews are screwed down, that it had to be a seated show? Um, the only one that I... Do you remember the band The Darkness? No, but it sounds heavy. <laughs> um, he had this falsetto voice, 
Um, and they had, they were one hit wonder. Mm -hmm. And they went to War Memorial because we couldn't do a GA floor. And yeah. that's the only one I remember in eight years. Yeah, I was just curious, because every time I go, I mean, I'm happy to be sitting watching whatever it is I'm watching, but some shows, it'd be a totally weird vibe. Um, oh, you know what, Pat Green never played the Ryman because he likes the GA floor. Sure. Robert O'Keen loves the GA floor, but he's fine with the Ryman. Yeah. I don't think that was as big a factor as you might think. Like, I, those are the only two that really cool. jump out. Pat Green and that band called The Darkness. What, um, I, I've seen you in work mode and you weren't doing much sitting and watching music. Uh, I'm assuming you were probably doing the same with the Ryman, but did you ever have time to watch like some incredible moments or incredible oh, gosh, shows yes. that stand out and for you? And you have to make a point of going into the auditorium at least more than once during every show so you know what that felt like. Like, I can't know if I need to book that band again if I don't know what it felt like. Mm -hmm. Who were some of the favorite artists or shows that, moments, really, you know, that you had a chance to see? Um, so, um, probably the, the pivotal moment at the Ryman um, with Ali Harnell and I were, was Coldplay in, 20, in 2003. Um, it was a pivotal moment for the band. They had just won that armload of Grammys and had that amazing performance. We booked them before Grammy nominations. Um, and then uh, I think the show played 10 days after the Grammys. And they were playing arenas now and then the Ryman. And people didn't understand how we got that show. And I'll tell you how we got that show. They wanted, I don't think this is proprietary anymore, they wanted 40 grand. And we thought that was too much. <laughs> and I was at this slow bar and Michael Grimes um, is an incredible tastemaker. I used to ask him tons of times, Grimey, should I buy this? Grimey should I buy this? I was like, I, by the, I was standing by the jukebox, and I go, hey, should I buy Coldplay? They want too much money. He goes, can you do that now? Like, could you book that now? And I was like, you mean like, because I mean like call Allie and book it now? <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. So I did. I called yeah, Allie and okay, said, Grimey says that. we need to book that now, and he, he thinks we're just being babies about money, and, and we have got to get that on the books. Mm -hmm. um, and that made other shows easier. Sure. And then you mentioned earlier about how in Music City you'll have uh, you'll have Ryan Adams and Gil and Dave will come out, or you'll have Jason Isbell and Ryan Adams will come out. Mm -hmm. um, so we had Harry Connick Jr. used to do Harry for the holidays. Yeah. Does he still do that? No, he doesn't do that anymore. I haven't seen it, but uh, With a lot of my family's like New Orleans, yeah. friends down there. So I know he still does there. I don't know about Nashville. I don't know if he's touring Harry for the holidays. Yeah. But anyway, so it was too, we got it to the point where we could do two nights with him, and he had like a 22-piece orchestra with the faux like bandstand stuff. It was yeah. really pretty to watch and audibly beautiful too. Um, and he, Harry had cut a song with George Jones or play the piano or something, and George Jones walks on. That's awesome. And um, sings a couple of songs and leaves, and then Harry just has this moment with the audience where he says, okay, I'm very comfortable with my masculinity. I'm a big, strong guy. I'm, f just to be honest with you, I'm married to a supermodel, but I felt like such a little boy around <laughs> George Jones. And he just took, he had on like loafers, and he goes, look at these shoes, for instance. He goes there, when metrosexual was a word, oh, he was yeah. like, oh. So he took off his shoes, he threw them in the audience, he laid on there, he was like, I just need a minute to recover. And it was like just so natural. Yeah. It just was an organically natural thing. Sure. Um, and then that I, had to be a credible moment. Just, yeah. Yeah. And, and if you pick the other night, you're like, oh, shit, I missed the good night, or, you know. Yeah. Um, then I always like the divas in that setting, like um, uh, Chrissy Hines. She's just a freaking force of nature. If, she's like the archetype. If you need to be a rocker chick, just be, just do Chrissy Hines. Sure. Watch, study that shit. Um, Annie Lennox. Um, so we had Erica Badu a couple of times, and one time um, there was some general jackassery in the balcony, <laughs> and somebody took the, the fire extinguisher off the, like they, a fight broke out. Mm. And somebody took the fire extinguisher off the wall and was going to throw it at this guy, but it's in the pews, so people start to scatter. I have to turn the house lights up in the balcony. Erica Badu admonished, she just admonished the crowd, like just 
just tore them down yeah. and stood there and said, you need to fit and curse on like a queen. It was great. You know, figure it out, people. I'll stand here and wait. And did, and it was wow. great. Um, trying to think. Oh, God, I'm sure yeah. there's hundreds. Thousands. Hundreds. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Dave Brubeck is one of my favorite stories because I like jazz a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I just was too... I have my timeout record from college, and I brought it to work, and I just couldn't, I couldn't get it autographed. I just was too shy. I just couldn't do it. We were talking about that earlier with a different guest. Um, has there been any other artists like that for you, or any ones that you were like really pumped as a fan to just be able to work with? So, um, for a very short period, um, in the before Starwood opened in 1988, I did a tour manager gig with a summer. Summer of Love Tour in 88. So um, it was Rascals, Tommy James, Mitch Ryder, um, Rascals were the headliners. And we played Atlantic's, Atlantic Records' 40th anniversary show at Madison Square Garden. And I had not met, this was 1988, and I had not met Robert Plant before. And in, in real life, it was taped. And if you could ever find it, you should watch it. Sure. In real life, the Rascals opened for Led Zeppelin. And so we were switching green rooms. And Felix Cavallari at, introduced me to um, Robert Plant, and he was not very nice. Um, and, I, and it ruined Led Zeppelin for me for like a decade. <laughs> and I love Zeppelin. And then he played the Ryman several times, and uh, we went across the street to Roberts and danced in the balcony. Yeah. So I got to dance with Robert oh, Plant, that's awesome. and that was great. Yeah. Um, but all that stuff too, Robert Plant and Allison Krauss, and how that just sort of organically happens, and it's happening on your stage. And oh, when we talk about just the incredible history of performers at the venue alone, it's it's nuts. It's awesome. I never, I did not get to do um, Aretha there. Yeah. So Darren Lashinsky and I booked Aretha, bought the full page ad in the scene, and the day the night before we went on sale, she canceled. Mm. So I know she's been to the Ryman. She actually sure. made it and performed, but I think only once, right? I, I did do um, Ben Morrison. He had not played in Nashville, in the city of Nashville, for 22 years, and we got Ben Morrison. That's cool. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, that one's a really cool one. Yeah. Um, so... People, students, when they're signing up to learn about the live and they're signing up to learn about festivals and fairs, kind of, what are you teaching them exactly? I'm teaching just the basics of who does what. Yeah. Um, you know, here's what a buyer does. Here's what a promoter does. Here's sure. how ticketing works. Really the basics. Here's what agents do. Yeah. Um, and then what an offer is. Well, we start to start there and then just build it up. Mm -hmm. Just um, live is complicated. Sure. It's got a lot of moving parts and pieces. Um, and there's really two clients. There's the patron in the front of the house. There's the act in the backstage area. Mm -hmm. It's it's complicated. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things we always try to do when, when, when I'm interviewing uh, guests is provide some type of value to whoever our viewers are, uh, <laughs> uh, other than us just shoot the shit. Cause right, because seriously. That's cause very you're, easy for me to do. Because your path will never be my path, and my path yeah. will never be your path, and you can't, it's just, everybody has their own life. Yeah, so I want to be able to show these, uh, whoever's watching, whoever you guys are watching, um, hopefully some tricks of the trade, some things that maybe help them. Yeah, uh, well, I have my first one that I always say, is Go you need a hard skill. And be, I'm passionate about music is not a hard skill. Mm -hmm. I'm a hard worker is not a hard skill. I'm the first one to leave, first one in the morning and the last one, not a hard skill. Mm -hmm. Here are hard skills. I can read a Ticketmaster audit. I can build a show in Ticketmaster. I can reconcile a bank account. I can, um, I can do accounts payable. I can code accounts payable. I have a forklift operator's license. I can operate a spotlight. I can operate a trust spot. Like, those are hard skills. Sure. And you should have one. Oh, uh, I preach it all Dawson the time. has a hard skill. He does. Like, he knows how to do this. That's exactly. a hard skill. Yeah. And he can demonstrate it to you. Like, you can't yeah. demonstrate a passion for music. No. That's just... It may start as a passion, but find some way to bring value to whoever it is you're going to work for. Have a hard skill. A hard skill. Especially early on. Sure. Like, here's what I know. how. To, I know how to write code. 
If hard I were skill. 20, that's what I would be doing right now. Yeah. I would be learning how to write code. I tell you, if I could go back right now, it would be, uh, they call it skills, but it's basically kind of writing code, but for all these voice activated, like yes. Alexa, blah, 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 yes. blah. Yes. You know? That's going to be really, I'm really fascinated by that right now, and I'm digging in as much as I can. So it would be like, Alexa, order me shampoo. Well, how does she, what shampoo does she choose? Right. On the brand side of things, right. like there's a whole lot of things that are going on the back end. Well, I want to understand that. that artificial intelligence. It's learning all the time. Mm -hmm. Like your computer is learning all the time. Your car is learning all the time. Well, not all cars, sure. but you know, yeah. Alexa is learning you sure. all the time. The more you talk to Alexa, the more she knows about you. Oh, I love that it. artificial intelligence. The side of it that's going to be really interesting is when you're talking about if, if you've never ordered shampoo from her before, let's say. Uh, what brand does she pick? Yeah. And how does that brand become the top pick? Is it through pay? Is it through clicks? Is it like all these additional parts? Does are she be know really your credit? Does Does Alexa have access to your credit card payment history? Don't does know she yet. know? I'm still digging in on it. I just yeah. think it's going to be really fascinating the next two, three, five years of, you know, hey Alexa, buy me those tickets to such and such. Yeah. You know, if that's a thing, yeah. if they can. Yes. You know? Oh, Mark Geiger says they can. Mark yeah. Geiger says that's going to happen and that's going to oh, happen fast. No question. No more sitting there and going. Oh, they sold That's out. The, that is the thing. Well, we didn't sell out. There's no such thing as a sellout anymore. Sure. Bots have ruined the music business. There's no such thing as a sellout. And we've got to fix that. Mm -hmm. Well, that actually takes us to the next uh, thing we were that I was going to discuss is trends that you see coming that you're excited about, trends that we've been seeing for a while that you're excited we will have to going away. Yeah, we'll fix ticketing. Um, Taylor Swift, I admire her and Louie for just going... I'm going to take the hit on this. Y'all are going to talk bad about me. You're not going to understand what I'm doing with my ticket pricing, but I'm fixing, I'm attempting to begin to fix ticketing. Sure. Sorry about that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Ten years from now, you'll either remember and recognize or you won't. Sorry it had to happen, but yeah. somebody has to do it. And so she decided that she'd take that hit. Mm -hmm. And you will be able to say, I'm listening to Alexa play, play Cashmere. Sure. Alexa, is um, is Robert Plant touring? She is, or he is. Uh, he's playing like buy two tickets um, somewhere between fifty dollars and one hundred and fifty dollars. Yep. And she'll just do it. Exactly. That's going to be game changing. Yes. For a lot of different industries. Yep. Ours is especially. Yeah. The um, because you need to go where people are are consuming. Sure. If they are, I mean, people consume more music right now than they ever have. And they have more control over their consumption than they ever have. Yeah. Now, like I, I, sometimes I have to rationalize that into my own life because I have a six CD changer that I love so much. And I have so many CDs and I like, like I like jazz and I play jazz all the time. And I like this kind of jazz. I do not like Pandora's. Pandora thinks she and I don't agree on <laughs> jazz. Yeah. Like I, I don't like Stingray's jazz. It doesn't suck, but it's not my favorite jazz. I need to control over my music. Sure. I found, I found that I'm a terrible creature of habit. Uh, and if I'm not served playlist, I will just revert back to 80s music. Like, I don't seek new music out anymore. The, and uh, for me, that's come and gone. That yeah. is a, a nasty byproduct of working in the music industry. I think it has. Is yeah. that you become musically fatigued and you become jaded and it's a nasty byproduct. And I wax and wane. And mm -hmm. this is another Ryman story. Is As a Nashvillian, my husband bought tickets to see Jason Isbell in 2014 on his first multi-night yeah. run. Um, totally as a patron, um, I, I could have sung the, the hook to Alabama Pine. That's about it. I didn't know shit. Yeah. And came in uh, totally blind and, well, not totally blind because I knew to drive by truckers. That's not true. Sure. I became in, came in uneducated and loved it so much. What we now possess multiple copies of every CD he's ever owned because it used to be in several different places so I can play it whenever I need to. Yeah. Um, and and that show reignited my love of music discovery. And it has and I've written that till now. So I've written it for three full years. Yeah. Uh, 
I have to judge it all the time when I listen to new music that's being served to me. And uh, to turn that off is hard. So I like when I can just jump on a Spotify playlist or something that sends me new stuff. I mean, not like 80% of it, but at least I'm not just listening to Hall Notes all the time. Well, and then everybody in my office, every employee I have is under the age of 30. So <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. there you go. I drive my staff crazy. They're like, for the love of God, no more 80s. Oh, no, I don't play any music. Since I started at the Ryman Auditorium, I am not the DJ. I don't. You just pass off, pass it somebody, off? Somebody, someone in my office will naturally assume that role and yeah. play music on their computer, and I listen to that. We started that a little bit last year where every day someone had a different. Yeah. It was their turn. It's your DJ. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think DJ now spin everyone that. just puts their phones in because uh, they know I'm going to listen. <laughs> I don't, yeah. I, since the Ryman really so, since 2000, so for 18 years I have not been master of my own playlist, Monday through Friday. That's probably good. Yeah, good it is. Good. Yeah. Because um, I will say, you know, what I did, um, every once in a while Cole will play something and I'll go, Cole, who is that? Veta, Greta Van Fleet. Cole, mm-hmm. who is that? SZA. Cole, who is that? Yeah. Uh, I'll go Because he love. has a great taste. He has a great musical taste. Well, we'll go through, with all the festival clients that we work with, like when we're seeing hangouts line up oh, yeah. or all this stuff, I'm like, who in the world? So I'll force myself to go listen to mm-hmm. the entire lineup yeah. so I'm not the old dude. Yeah. You know, just going, who are these youngsters in this loud music? And, and, um, and some of it is not designed for you. Sure. Like some of it, I see the influences, what they're just not even thinly veiled. Mm-hmm. And I, that's yours or yours. Like somebody turns 15 every day, that's their Led Zeppelin. That's their totally. um, Aretha Franklin. That's their Sam Cooke. Mm-hmm. That's not my Sam Cooke. Yeah. Well, some of the things I found really interesting is we've been pushing out, uh, from my agency to standpoint, uh, not just from Festival World, I actually start working with more theaters and PACs and actually what you told me to do when we sat down and talked the first time. Um, and it's been uh, interesting, their process of learning about the digital side. Uh, Venue operators and festival operators? Well, a lot of the just civic centers, coliseums, uh, PACs, theaters, that when we're going in, we're really, it's like your students uh, on the digital side of the digital marketing. Um, have you seen a lot more questions coming up through IEBA stuff? You've been having to do more uh, panels and like, is there a need for more of that? Are they asking to learn more of that side of the business? Like, they know their market, no question. They know their radio, they know their print, they know all that. They're just hiring 24 year olds, 23 year olds. That's what we all do. Yeah. That's why Bob Kelly hired me. Yeah. I mean, he, he would ask me all the time, should I book Journey? Oh, my God. That, you know, like, that's it. You mm-hmm. just, because you can't, you can't be 23 when you're 53, and you can't be 53 when you're 23, and everybody has their own value. Sure. So, um, I, and, and there's always going to be those innovators and industry leaders. So, yes, we'll come and share best practices. But yeah. I, I would say... Some of the challenges with those, are those metro, are they? Yeah, some of them are. And then the other part is just they want to do it, but it's, it's, it's a nonprofit and budget's tied. And mm-hmm. the, the, we're just getting all these answers. It's just been really uh, interesting how different they all are, a state away or counties away sometimes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And how long that person has been in that job and that mm-hmm. job security and not want to rock the boat. And, and a lot of us, too, is in-house marketing staff, and then we go look and, it's tough, and I have to. I'll reach out to the GM or the executive director and be like, "All right, this is an essay. I know you didn't ask for this, but there are some severe holes in the boat. Uh, work with us or not, but I, I honestly feel like it's our duty to let you know, like you are leaving thousands of dollars on the table, just from like this one little thing over here that you're not really doing." Um, yeah. Are promoters are they promoting their own shows? A lot of them. Okay. And, you know, and some of them are like. We just see the value in it. We want to support our promoters st- right. well, strongly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Good our, buildings have to. You know, yeah, we get them in the door for their event. We're going to sell booze and food, and then we're going to be able to sell them, a, you know, take it to the ballet and this comedian yeah, yeah, or absolutely. whatever it is yeah. that they're putting on yeah. themselves. Yeah. Uh, it's just been, um, you know, different. Because, you know, festivals are night and day than a PAC. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because um, their audience is night and day. Literally, literally night <laughs> yes. and day. I talked to one the other day. Talking about your twenty-three fifty-three. Really, uh, one was saying this like, um, 
my clientele are literally dying faster than I can replace them. Oh, yeah. And I was like, well, I went and looked at it. I was like, I, I can see. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's just really eye-opening. And generationally, it's interesting because I am, I am technically, depending on where you draw that line, I am the youngest baby boomer or the oldest Gen Xer. And because I never worked fast food and I never worked at the mall, or I identify a little bit older because when I was 15, I was working in all adults, and I always worked with adults. Sure. Um, but that little generation in between, the baby boomers and the millennials, like we're now in charge of most everything. Yeah. But we are outnumbered and always have been. Yeah, uh, just 37, and they kept trying to dump me into the millennials too. I'm a 37 now, but I was 35. You, you know, don't read time. millennial to me, yeah. Yeah, and actually what they did is they came out with a new term. I don't remember what they called it, but it was a mixture of the two. And they were like, you were around when the Internet was born. You didn't have one of these in your hand at two, uh, but you, you, know, you got on AOL. You chatted. You were kind of familiar with it. Uh, but there was like, I don't remember what the name of it was, but I was like, once well, they defined it, I was like, oh, shit, that's definitely yeah. me, this thing. And people are always on the cusp of, Yeah. well, not always, not always. Some yeah. people are on the cusp of things, and some people are on the dead center. Yeah. This one pretty much summed me up. I was like, finally, because I sure as hell wasn't <laughs> that, and I know I was not that. Uh, so it made a lot of sense. Um, if you had to give a tip out there to someone who wants to be um, a buyer, promoter, what is it? They actually want to be a buyer or they want to work for a buyer? The dream is they want to be in live and they want to make the shows oh, come to life. Right. Oh, so they don't. Know, they don't need to be a buyer. Because oh, here's the well, joke. Here's the joke. And it's this has been a joke. Most of them don't know if buyers 80s. exist. So oh. at this point, you know, uh, maybe they're thinking they want to be a concert promoter. Okay. Or here's the yeah. joke, and this is a joke goes all the way back to the eighties. You need to go to the bank and get ten thousand dollars in cash. You need to put it in a paper bag. You need to put it in the middle of the floor, light it on fire, stand in the corner, and resist the urge to put it out. If you can do that, then you can be a concert promoter. There you go. That's the truth. I've heard that one before. It's been a oh, while. Oh, it's been around for a while. But it's damn true. It's damn true. <laughs> it's damn, because that is. you may or may not make money tonight. That's the truth. I lost. And uh, you lost. can ask every real promoter, what's the most amount of money you lost in a single night? And they will tell you just like that. Allie Harnell will tell you, am I going to say the name of the artist, $238,000 sure. in a single night. Every promoter will, t will know. Every real promoter will know. The biggest loss, the biggest hit they took in a single night in their career. Oh, God, that's brutal. Quarter of a million dollars in one night. But then you forget about the ones where you made a quarter of a million dollars because hey, that's, that's exactly your job. Where I was about to go. That's your job. My job is to make. Sure. My job is to make however much this is. My job is to lose money on all these shows, break even if I can, lose mm -hmm. a couple of thousand, um, build that artist or build my market or both if, mm -hmm. you, if you're not doing national tours, if you're playing in your own backyard. Um, and then build them into the next level and the next level and the next level. And then when they get to arenas, then I can make, as a promoter, $100,000 a night. Sure. And that lets me build my Ryman shows. Absolutely. Um, it all ends tomorrow. That's it. What do you hope your legacy's been? Oh, I don't know. You know, I think it's probably... Two things. I hope I've helped. An, I've hope I've helped another woman in the business, and then, and I already know. I don't need the accolade for it, but I know that I've I've helped build this market. Absolutely. Like I've just been here. I, I can point here. Here you go. Yeah. And that's kind of fun. I read something in one of your other interviews, and I wanted. Was to it from a long time ago? It was. That's okay. why I dug it up. Okay. Uh, I wonder if you still think it's true. And it was a quote you gave: uh, "Wisely and slow." They stumble that run fast. Do you yeah. remember saying that? Yeah, and I know which. Uh, that article was from In and Out Magazine, which is Nashville's gay publication. Is it still? It's still out there floating okay. around. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was like seven pages of Google deep. So <laughs> many, like, it, but it used to be like one of the top five things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was still digging in. I read that whole the yeah. whole article. Yeah, just be cool. Yeah. And, Stick uh, around for a minute. Yeah. And and. The, the shorter version of that is bloom where you're planted. Just just be here. Just sure. be happy where you are for a minute. The bloom where you're planted has come up with three different guests now, yeah. and I love that. Bloom where you're planted, man. Yeah, don't be so worried about the next damn pot. I swear, and 
and, and it's the, like have an attention span. Um, I, I can name two, two young colleagues right now that have great gigs and are, and are looking at every offer somebody gives them because they've worked with, they have been two years in a great gig. Sure. So there's two of them. Yeah. I just passed. Just yeah. go, oh, that's so flattering. Thank you, but. Yeah, don't even think about it. Yeah. Just don't even think about it. So I've owned property in Nashville for a number of years, and um, a lot of it has been uh, property built in the late 30s, early 40s, this Green Hills area, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And we used to get flyers and stuff in the mail. Um, I buy houses, and you're, I'm like, you're not knocking this house down. Like, sure. just, it's, just, I don't even look at the number. I, 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 I'll do me, and when I need to sell, I'll figure out what I need to do. I'm good. Yeah. Um, what's the secret? What's the secret to have a 30-year career? I don't know. I have no idea. We said this before Dawson turned the camera on, um, was um, I, I know what I know. Like, I know how to do stuff. Sure. I know how to do shit. All that shit I named, I know how to do that shit. Yeah. I could do it right now. Um, but the stuff that, like, as that esoteric, like, I don't know. I don't know anything. I don't know anything. Yeah. I don't know how or why the world works. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And, well, here's one thing I know is I'm not in control. I'm not in charge. Doors open and close, like, mm -hmm. all the time. Why, why does stuff happen? Like, don't you yeah. just sometimes watch, like, I think that Johnny Depp is a very interesting case study. Johnny Depp was the shit, the shit. Oh, yeah. Madonna was the shit. But time, like, time and public opinion have not been favorable to them right now. Sure. Like, just one false move. I mean, like, one lip injection or one bad girlfriend, and yeah. suddenly an a amazing body of work is just... Frowned on. It's, yeah, it's weird. Yeah. It's just weird. One thing, one yeah. thing can happen that's not, you're not in control of. Yeah. Uh, I rarely take off anymore. Like I'm just in the cave working all the time because I was trying to, I'm trying to build an agency. Yeah. Uh, but I realized I had to force myself to pill out uh, over December, January so I can, you know, Rejuvenate. Breathe and yeah, rejuvenate yeah, and just yeah. step out of the business. And to and be kinda, creative. You got yeah, to do something to be creative. Yeah, I need to be out a little yeah. while so I can look back at it. Uh, and one of those things uh, that I was doing this last trip was really looking at, man, it doesn't feel like I've been in town this long. It doesn't feel like I've been in the business 12 years. It doesn't feel like this, but how did it get to this place? And I've looked at kind of what you were talking about, like all these other opportunities, these little doors, these little things that just kept me between the navigational beacons unbeknownst to me at the time, right. you know? So, um, do you know Megan Wilson who works at Red Light Management? Uh, I know her name. You should know her. Yeah. Um, so she worked for Louie and Allie, um, and then um, Corin Stoller, and now she works for Red Light. So there was a whole big core of us in the early 2000s, and we, like, you know, we owned this town. <laughs> we went out and drank and partied and booked all the cool shows and did all the cool shit. Yeah. Um, so one night, leading into Fourth of July weekend, um, we were all at the Red Door. Yeah. Not the original Red Door. I think there might be two or three now. No, there's an East Side one, but okay, everybody so the knows the Red Door. So the Red Door Saloon. And they had all gotten started at like three in the afternoon, having a few cocktails. And I didn't, I couldn't leave the Ryman until 6.30, and you can't catch up at that point. Sure. It's just you're not going to catch up. So Megan um, had a daughter, or has a daughter, and she was younger at the time. She didn't go out with us that much. And she was, <laughs> she's not a weepy drunk. Yeah. She's just that particular night, she was just a little melancholy, and we culled her from the herd, and we pulled her toward the front. Um and me and Heather's story were talking to her. She was like, I just don't understand why they don't get along. And these three guys come walking in the bar. Three of us, three of them. I ended up marrying one of them because oh. Megan Wilson had a little <laughs> too much to drink and started crying one night. <gasps> what? Yeah. That's. Rod S. had called and said, hey, I got your next gig for you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Miss, just a miss little. all those little, I dodged this and I've. <clears throat> Duck that. And I know, isn't it incredible? I think when, it, when it's doing that, 
that I'm on the right path. Because it's keeping me on it. Even when I've tried to be like, well, fuck it, I'm just going to go sell vacuums now. Or like, I've had enough or whatever. Have you, have you had those moments? <clears throat> uh, the city, when you first move here, can certainly make you question yourself. I really? You know? uh, it wasn't like that back then. Well, I mean, I'd already built two businesses and lost my ass as a promoter. Uh, I moved that's here right, that's right. practically homeless and was a, <laughs> fucking became an intern at 30 again. So yeah. I was building back over. So oh, I was already okay. not, okay. you know, king okay. of the world mode. It didn't yeah. take much to thump me off. Okay, uh, yeah, I get it. But yeah, so I had to go through that process of kind of second guessing and going, what the fuck am I going to do? Is this for me? But every time I started to pull out, there'd be one of those moments to go, what are you doing, man? This is the path. Stay the course, you know. They stumble that run fast. Mm -hmm. Stay the course. Yeah, stay the course. Be patient. Stay the, Bloom where you're yeah, fucking planted. They stumble and run fast. That's right. Cool. Well, to wrap everything up, what we normally do is I'll go through just four quick questions. Okay. And you just tell me what you think. Okay. I did actually, so here, here I do have some axioms that I believe are true. Okay. Actions speak louder than words. I, that is absolutely 100% true in my book. Yeah. You can always tell what people, what they value by where they spend their time and their money. Like people talk, people just talk, 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 yeah. talk. You can pretend to care, but you can't pretend to show up. Like that, actions speak louder than words. That's that's that I know for sure. And then that flash over substance stuff. Mm -hmm. I have I have a thing about that. Like I almost am one of those attraction rather than promotion girls. Like when we came into Aiba, it was kind of like could we just started doing it better. Yeah. We just updated it. I didn't buy a bunch of advertising. I just started programming differently and yeah. pulling in some different opinions and and it just attracted people because we had what they wanted and then they told other people. Yeah. We didn't go out and promote a whole lot. I'm not a big promoter. I just just do good and people will figure it out. And word'll get out. It'll get out. And those I mean you can't buy that kind of advertising. Yeah. So what am I what else did I have? Oh, I have one that I actually, I, I believe, but I don't know if I can explain it. Sure. That if you can remove fear, whatever that fear is, if you can somehow learn to live with, with it, remove it through meditation, whatever you can do, fear other than the fear of falling, the fear of walking out in front sure. of a, you know, like the... Actual fears. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The healthy fears. Yeah. The healthy, if you can Things remove... Things that save you. Yeah, the healthy fears. If you can like, embrace those. Yeah. But if you can, if somehow overcome, make friends with, eliminate, remove unhealthy fears, mm -hmm. like that, that would be a good goal. Absolutely. Like systematically in my 50s, I've realized I just mm -hmm. wasn't plagued with it sure. very much when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I'm not really, I don't have a lot of it. Yeah. But so it's easier for maybe for me to identify that is an unfounded, stupid fear. I'm getting so much better at that now, and I don't know why. I never had it before I moved to Nashville. This concern about other people's freaking opinions. Yeah, I don't really have that. I never, I never had it until I got here, and then it was this thing. Even with this show, uh, I thought about it for a year and a half, and then just instead of doing it, didn't do it. Yeah. Because of this fear. And uh, thank goodness I had all that time on vacation by myself to go, what the fuck am I doing? No other aspect of my life would I just wait around for a year and a half. Yeah. I would just go. I was going to do so, that. Here, here we sit. Yeah. You know? And yeah. I'm so glad that uh, I finally got to the place of saying we're going to do that. I have that in my that. daily meditation. Yeah. Please remove fear. Absolutely. And then that stupid, yeah, ego. Yeah. All is vanity. I mean, that goes back to Thomas Aquinas. All is vanity. All yeah. is ego. All that's evil is ego. Mm -hmm. It is. I was stewing and stewing on the same. This vacation, I'll tell you what, it was incredible for me. I really Did needed it. Did you leave the house? Did you oh, go somewhere? Yeah, I was in Dominican Republic for 14 uh, days. Two okay. full weeks off okay. the grid. No email, uh, no okay. phone. Just yeah. away. Yes. And uh, I was meditating a lot. I felt like it was... Uh, I was generally thankful, but I wasn't being grateful for everything that I'd built and where I was. And I was trying to get to that place of like truly feeling grateful. Uh -huh. And I finally got there and I was like, finally, I can like meditate to a different level now. And, uh, but there was just one thing specifically business, like a big growth spurt that we were going through. And I was trying to find the answer and think it through. And it just, the answer wasn't coming. And it <laughs> kept not coming. It kept not coming. Rest of the vacation never came. The whole flight in never came. And on the 
drive home from D.C., uh, it just finally came. Yeah. I was off in La La Land just so focused on the answer that I nearly rear-ended the car in front of me, and their tag said, kill ego. Like, I was like four inches Holy from it. Holy shit. Yeah, and I was like... You could have passed the message along another way other than damn near kill me. But uh, I got it. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So I do that, um, and it usually comes to me the next day when I'm brushing my teeth. Like yeah. you, If you ask Cole, like seriously, you should call Cole and go, yeah. when does your boss have her best ideas? Just like that. He'll go, when she's brushing her teeth. Because I'll go, oh, yeah, I was brushing my teeth, and I remembered. We yeah. need to blank and blank. Yeah. Like that, it's that repetitive. Sure. It's really a zen like motion. It's repetitive. There's a sound of water involved. Sure. Like it's, yeah. it's a mindless activity. So this is engaged, so this can engage and spit out the answer. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Mornings are my time. Yeah. It's the only time that's mine. Evening is sure as hell aren't. And the midday isn't it. The mornings are mine to be able to focus, actually think through things. And mine is not even, it's, it's not about focus. It's a, it just, everything else has worked overnight and just mm -hmm. it spits it out like a ticket. Yeah. Here's the answer. Here's the answer. Like, like, and yours took 14 days, but I bet it was kind of a complicated process. Oh, it was a big one, yeah. It was complicated. Yeah. There were lots of issues. Well, Your as soon as I approached it with that, I removed ego from the equation. The answer presented itself, and it turned out probably a thousand times better than it would have if I would have went in aggressively. Now, you can use... For me, if I use swagger on somebody else's behalf, like if I'm representing an artist, I can use my best skills and a little bit of swagger, sure. and that's cool too. But that's to me, that's not ego. That's negotiating skills sure. and whatever. Yeah, absolutely. No, I have that part. This was like uh, you know, the future of the business. Mm -hmm. There was so many things that went into it, but I would just, you know, my name's on the door, so I was approaching it very much like mine rather than being open and allowing the, you know, the answer to flow. But shit, I'm so glad I did because it turned out a million times better. Good. Yeah. yeah. It does, doesn't yeah. it? If you it can really just does. get out of the way. I got out of the way. That's Sometimes all it really boils down to. Sometimes you have to get out of the way. Yeah. Um, well, guys, thanks so much for joining us. Miss Pam Matthews. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. For anybody that's trying to follow a dream No holding back, you'll get it by any means Idols on the wall, you cut out for magazines Full of self-esteem, nobody can intervene Ready for the shine, you never need in the shade This is for the boss that never gave you a raise This is for every time you ever try to create And no one understood, they never gave you the space Walking up to you, they trying to give you the crown Look into your eyes and tell you you want to bust Every time you turn around and face the crowd Be ready cause your time is now It's my time